Hello and welcome in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Whether you're watching this at Zion Lutheran Home or whether you're watching from somewhere around the world online, God be with you as we hear his word for today. Today we are celebrating the 16th Sunday after Pentecost. And as always, we begin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I invite you to join together in the opening responses which will appear on your screen or on your worship orders. Praise God for the Lord our God is King. Let, Let us, us rejoice and be glad. glad. Let, Let us praise, praise his, his greatness. greatness. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who, who was, was and, and is and is, is to come. come. Worthy is Christ the Lamb who was slain to, to receive, receive honour and glory and praise. He loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and, and has made, made us to be a kingdom, a kingdom and, and priests to, to serve, serve his God, God and Father. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be, be praise, praise and honour and, and glory and power forever and ever. And ever. Amen. I invite you to join in singing the hymn, How Sweet the Name of Jesus Sounds, together with members of the St. Paul's Congregation. name of Jesus is sweet to our ears because he alone is the one who brings forgiveness for us through his suffering, death and resurrection. So let us come before the Lord and confess our sins that we may receive his mercy anew. Let us confess our sins. 
Most merciful God, we confess to you and before one another that we have sinned against you in our thoughts, words and actions. We have not loved you with our whole heart and we have not loved our neighbour as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. As a called and ordained servant of the word, I announce the grace of God to all of you. On behalf of my Lord Jesus Christ and by his command, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Peace be with you. Amen. The Lord be with you and, and also, also with you. you. Let us pray. Loving and righteous God, you are far more generous to us and to all who work in your kingdom than we desire or deserve. Make us generous to others as you have been to us. We ask this through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Our first Bible reading for today comes from the book of Jonah, chapter 3, beginning at verse 1, and then picking it up again at verse 10 and carrying through into chapter 4. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, Get up, go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah set out and went to Nineveh, according to the word of God. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly large city, a three days walk across. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's walk. And he cried out, Forty days more, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And they believed God. They proclaimed a fast, and everyone, great and small, put on sackcloth. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. But this was very displeasing to Jonah, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, is not this what I said while I was still in my own country? That is why I fled to Tarshish at the beginning, for I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and ready to relent from punishing. And now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, is it right for you to be angry? Then Jonah went out of the city and sat down east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade, waiting to see what would become of the city. The Lord God appointed a bush and made it come up over Jonah to give shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was very happy about the bush. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the bush so that it withered. When the sun rose, God prepared a sultry east wind and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint and asked that he might die. He said, it is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the bush? And he said, yes, angry enough to die. Then the Lord said, you are concerned about the bush for which you did not labour and which you did not grow. It came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should I not be concerned about Nineveh, that great city, in which there are more than 120,000 people who do not know their right hand from their left, and also many animals? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Today's Gospel reading is written in Matthew chapter 20, beginning from verse 1. 
Jesus said, For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire labourers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the labourers for the usual daily wage, he sent them into his vineyard. When he went out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace, and he said to them, You also go into the vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. When he went out again about noon and about three o'clock, he did the same. And about five o'clock he went out and found others standing around, and he said to them, Why are you standing here idle all day? They said to him, Because no one has hired us. He said to them, You also go into the vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, Call the labourers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and then going to the first. When those hired about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily wage. Now when the first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received the usual daily wage. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner, saying, These last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last the same as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first and the first will be last. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise be to you, O Christ. Christ. I invite you to join together with me in confessing our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Some of you may remember an accident that occurred in 2012 with an Italian cruise ship which capsized. This large vessel ended up laying on its side in the water in the region of Tuscany, Italy. The captain of the ship came under scrutiny for his role in what happened and the actions that he took and the actions that he didn't take. Now we all know the captain's supposed to go down with the ship to be the last one standing. But it seems that Captain Scatino was not so keen on doing that and began leaving the boat early. I'm going to read to you a bit of a transcript from a conversation that took place between the Coast Guard and the captain of the ship, Scatino. This is what transpired. Coast Guard says, listen, Scatino, there are people trapped on board. Now you go with your boat under the prow on the starboard side and there is a pilot ladder. You will climb that ladder and go on board and then you will tell me how many people there are. Is that clear? I'm recording this conversation. Captain Scatino, he pleads and responds with various excuses such as, the boat is tipping. I'm already in the rescue boat. Coast Guard says, you go aboard. It is an order. Don't make any more excuses. Go and call me when you are aboard. My air rescue crew is there. Captain Scatino responds, But do you realise it's dark and we can't see anything? Coast Guard says, And so what? You want to go home, Scatino? It's dark and you want to go home? Get on that prow of the boat using the pilot ladder and tell me what can be done. 
how many people there are and what their needs are now. You know, it would almost be comical if it weren't so serious because lives were being lost at that very moment. You know, when I read that true story, it reminds me of the sermon text today. The prophet Jonah was sent by God with a life-saving mission, a rescue mission. But Jonah was very reluctant to go. Jonah had been called by God to go to the ancient city of Nineveh to preach God's message and word to the people there. But Jonah didn't want to do that. He didn't want to do what God asked. Instead, he ran away and he headed in the completely opposite direction off to Tarshish, which is a a place in modern day Spain. That was, of course, until the boat he was on hit a violent storm, began to capsize and everyone's life on board was at risk. God actually had to use some really drastic measures to get Jonah's attention, to get him refocused on his calling. I wonder, have you ever tried to run away from God? What do you do when you know that God wants you to do something and you don't want to do it? I read about a seven-year-old boy who was apprehended by police in the state of Utah in America for driving a car. This seven-year-old boy led the police officers on a car chase, a a slow one at that, at about 70 kilometres an hour, but through the stoplights, through the signs, and eventually back again to the family house. And then he ran through the open garage door and went and hid upstairs. Of course, the police followed and caught him. And when the police asked him why he took his father's car and drove around, he told them the reason was he didn't want to go to church. Well, Jonah didn't want to do what God asked of him. But this story is actually not about Jonah at all. If you asked 100 people, you know, what's the story of Jonah all about? And most would say, well, it's about Jonah and the whale. But it's not really. It's not about Jonah, it's not about the big fish, it's not about the evil of the Ninevites. The principal character in this story is God. He is the hero. But some background first. Nineveh was the capital city of the Assyrian Empire. It was the world power centre of its day. You know, the, uh, the America of its time, maybe the, the New York or the Washington of that day. And the Assyrians and the Jews, they were long-time enemies. They had attacked Israel again and again. And anthropologists tell us that the Assyrians were one of the most brutal and cruel nations that ever existed on the earth. The Assyrians, they were feared and dreaded by all the nations around them because they didn't just kill the people they encountered, but they tortured them. And they didn't distinguish between men and women and children. And so there are actual records of whole towns of people who committed mass suicide rather than fall into the hands of the Assyrians. That's how much they were feared. The fact is there wasn't much nice about the Ninevite people at all because they were not only violent, but they were perverse and wicked beyond belief. As part of the worship of their demonic gods, they practiced child sacrifice as an act of worship. The people of uh, Assyria, they were known for their sorcery, their prostitution, their witchcraft, their sexual immorality. And their evil had not escaped God's notice. So God decided to send Jonah to them. Go and speak to these people, the sworn enemy of Jonah's own country. We find out later, though, that it wasn't fear of those people that made Jonah balk at this task. Jonah ran in the opposite direction. He took the boat and then God sent a violent storm. The crew determined that Jonah was the reason for it, for the storm. And he was, so they threw him overboard. And as we know, God provided a massive creature of the sea to rescue Jonah and get him back on track again. And when the sea became calm, it actually led to the conversion to faith in God of the sailors on board that ship. Jonah, though, eventually made his way toward the enormous city of Nineveh. 
And scripture says that a visit there required three days just to walk across it. That's a big city. But archaeological excavations have shown that Nineveh was part of a four city complex about a hundred kilometers in circumference. And so here is Jonah on his way to the power center of the world. And he had an awful lot of time to prepare his sermon along the way because he would have had to cross over about 800 kilometers of desert to get to Nineveh, 30, 40 days travel. And so he's had all this time to prepare his sermon. And this is what he said. 40 more days and Nineveh shall be destroyed or overthrown. His sermon was only five words in Hebrew. There was no message of God's loving nature, just threat. You know, that word destroyed or overthrown is the same word that describes the destruction that happened at Sodom and Gomorrah, obliteration. Now, it seems that Jonah made his message as offensive and as blunt as he possibly could. But an amazing thing happens. A miracle of God, because the people of Nineveh respond to it. The entire city, from the king down to the lowliest peasant, they believed God's message through Jonah. And everyone puts on sackcloth and ashes and they sat down in the dust. That was their cultural way of showing their sorrow and their repentance. And the king, who no doubt had been leading the nation in their wickedness and debauchery, he issued a decree that everyone shall call on God urgently. They shall seek God's mercy. And scripture tells us that God heard their cry and actually had compassion on them. So in spite of Jonah's reluctance, in spite of his half-hearted attempts, his lousy attitude, his poor sermon, the whole city falls to their knees in repentance and in prayer. And this is where the story gets more confronting for us. You would expect that maybe Jonah would be pleased with that, you know, the fantastic response to the sermon that he had preached. But the exact opposite happens. Jonah becomes angry and he throws a hissy fit. He goes off and he sulks under a, a shelter that he builds and he laments like a drama queen to God. And let me read some of what Jonah had to say to God. Take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. I knew you were going to do this. That's why I wanted to run away. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. You know, God exacerbates the problem for Jonah by then miraculously providing a shade vine one day and taking it away the next. And Jonah gets angrier again. And especially when God questions him about his anger, he again says to God, you know, I'm angry enough to die. Sounds a bit like the kid who says, you know, if I can't be the bowler, I'm going to take my cricket bat and stumps and go home. Or the toddler who threatens, I'll hold my breath until I turn blue. But now we actually find out the real reason that Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh. It wasn't fear of this vicious people. He simply wanted them dead. Jonah became angry because God was no longer angry with them when they repented. Jonah wanted justice, not grace. He wanted to see punishment, not forgiveness. And so Jonah's exceeding anger was not at the Ninevites, but actually at God. Jonah was angry that God would have compassion on his enemies. So in essence, he was saying to God, how dare you be a merciful God? Are we any different, though? We like to see justice done. You know, there was a video going around a few years ago on uh, social media about violence that was happening amongst a group of kids at Caboolture. And one video that I saw showed, you know, a 10 to 12 year old boy in broad daylight defying and then abusing and attacking a, a security guard uh, in the main shopping area in Caboolture. 
And then I read the comments that people added to this online story and there was heaps of additional stories of cruel and out of control behaviour from these same kids. And it appears that they had been picking on kids with disabilities in particular. And the overwhelming sentiment in the comments there was that these kids needed to be taught a lesson that justice is required. And I'm not disagreeing for one moment, but that's why God's mercy and his grace is so confronting to us. You know, as Jonah describes, God is a gracious God. He's merciful. He is slow to anger. He is abounding in steadfast love. You see, we have a God who loves without limit. A God who has mercy on the rebel and the enemy alike. A God who is concerned for all people, even those that we might humanly write off. Listen to what God's word tells us in Ezekiel chapter 33. God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather desires that they would turn from their ways and live. You know, if we want God to bring justice on those people, then God also needs to bring justice on us. He needs to hold us accountable. And I don't know how you would stack up, but I know that I would be in deep trouble. And that's why Jesus Christ came into the world, is to fulfil God's justice in our place. He suffers and dies mercilessly, cruelly, so that we could be forgiven, so that God's anger would not fall upon us. You know, the question that confronted the prophet Jonah was this mystery of the love of God, God's love for Nineveh, God's love for Jonah, God's love for us. Jonah tells God he would rather die than someone else receive God's mercy. You know, when you think about it, that's actually pretty sick, actually. Jonah's heart is so absorbed with self-love and self-pity at the expense of others. But how did God respond to Jonah's little games? Well, God shows his loving patience and mercy again. You know, this is one of those stories where it's good for us to stop and reflect, where are we in this story? Where are you? Are you a Ninevite who's living outside of God's will and defyingly doing what is sinful and disobedient? Or are you a Ninevite who knows what you've done wrong and you desire God's forgiveness? Are you a Jonah who knows what you should have done what God's will is, but you don't want to do it. You want to run away and ignore God. Or are you a Jonah who's happy to receive God's mercy and provision in your life, but you don't want God's grace given to your enemies? Or are you a Jonah who's angry with God, can't understand God's merciful ways at all? You know, as I said at the start, this Biblical story is not actually about Jonah, but it's a story of God's love and mercy because God is always searching. The Bible is full of the accounts of God's quest for the, the lost sheep, the lost coin, the prodigal sons, the lost souls, the lost ones. There is absolutely no one who is beyond the loving intention of Jesus. There is absolutely no one who is beyond redemption. Their sin is paid for by the sacrifice of Christ if only they would receive it and welcome it. You know, maybe you've seen some of those television shows over the years, you know, whatever happened to so-and-so, the celebrity or the, the one-hit wonder. Well, I wonder whatever happened to Jonah. There's absolutely nothing in this book that makes Jonah look anything but a hard-hearted and hateful, disobedient, childish, stubborn man. Did Jonah himself repent of his attitudes and change his hearts? We're, heart, rather, we're not told. But we know this, that Jonah wrote this book, and in it he doesn't hide his own weaknesses and failings. Maybe 
This book of Jonah was his public confession and his testimony to the mercy of God. I pray that you would recognise God's gift of mercy in your life, that it's not something that you have earned or deserved, but it comes entirely from his love alone. I pray that you would be honest enough to admit your foolish, petulant behaviours to God and repent and seek his forgiveness. I pray that you would in turn see others around you, those that you live with and work and play with, even your enemies, that you too would see them in the light of God's mercy as objects of his love for whom Christ died and rose. Thank you, Lord, for your steadfast love and mercy upon us. Amen. For those of you who are watching at Zion Home today, your offerings will be collected as we sing together our next song, together with people of the St Paul's congregation. in the prayer of the church the response will be our usual response Lord in your mercy hear our prayer let us pray Heavenly Father we praise and thank you for the unmerited mercy and grace shown to us in Jesus Christ grant that we may be people who live out his mercy in the lives of those around us help us to love our enemies and to pray for those who oppose the work of your church on earth. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our prayer. We pray, Lord, for your mission to the world and our partnership with overseas Lutheran churches. Bless and equip those pastors and theological students who are joining the online Lutheran theology course hosted by the Lutheran Study Centre in Indonesia. Grant healing to Pastor Jan Philip from the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Myanmar as he undergoes twice weekly treatment. Remember the Basel Christian Church of Malaysia who are mourning the death of their two missionaries, Francis Lior Yu Kien and Lily Chin Sen Yan as a result of contracting COVID-19. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. We pray for all those who travel and work upon the sea, 
grant protection to fishing vessels, crews and pleasure craft, oil tankers, cargo ships and exploration craft. Give their captains skill, good management and common sense and concern for the well-being of their passengers and crew. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. We pray for our St Paul's Child Care Centre and our staff who serve there. Be with Director Leanne and all her team as they seek to care for children and families of the Nunda community. Be especially with those who are new to the area or beginning childcare for the first time. Enable them to feel at home with new routines, faces and situations. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all schools, teachers and students around the state and country. Be with those in our local state schools at Nunda and Northgate, as well as the private schools in our area. Help all teachers to find joy in their task and satisfaction in caring for and developing young lives, skills and attitudes. Sustain them when weary and running low on patience. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We thank you, Father, for the life of Rita Miles and Alva Heusler. Be with their respective family members in their grief and sadness. Give them strength to carry on. Help them support one another. Wipe away their tears and reassure them of your eternal promises which come through faith in Jesus Christ alone. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Remember all those who are in any need, be it physical, mental, spiritual or emotional. Watch over our congregational members who are housebound and those battling with health issues. Keep them strong in faith and trusting in your ultimate goodness. And we bring before you now the people that we name silently in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. Continue to protect this state from coronavirus outbreaks. We thank you that the people of Victoria have been able to reduce the spread. Grant that a vaccine would be available in the near future. We ask all these things, along with the unspoken cries of our hearts, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour. Amen. We join together now in the prayer that our Lord has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favour and give you his peace. Amen. For those of you who are watching online, I will not be producing uh, videos over the next two weeks as I take a couple of weeks of annual leave, but I'll resume again after that period of time. So in the meantime, I encourage you to find other uh, services online and you may still receive the word of God in some form. God be with you.